Welcome to the Church of God Network podcast, everybody. I'm here with two of my really good friends, and I feel like, Tim, we've been talking about doing this since we started doing the podcast. I actually think you and I referenced (laughs) Other Dan in our first podcast. We've referenced Other Dan. Dan, Dan, Yeah, yeah, Other Dan at least two times in that one, probably, and then the one we do with Blake. So now other Dan is actually on the podcast. Dan Quimby's with other us. Dan, everybody. Yeah. Along with Tim Reynolds and myself. And the we've always wanted to get on the podcast to talk about something where we all disagree and just like record <laughs> it. And we thought, why not just talk about the topic of disagreement and the importance of different perspectives in terms of our growth and uh, the pursuit of unity and community in the church of God. Uh, so with that, I'd like the audience to get to know Dan a bit more. So Dan, if you can give us a bit of background about uh, your Church of God history, that'd be great. Sure, I'll, I'll make it really brief. Give me like 40 minutes. So <laughs> uh, well, I grew up in the church as a kid and around, I'm 40, just turned 40. So about 1992-ish, 93-ish is when my parents left Worldwide Church of God and they went to Global and then living after that. And then from there, I went out into the world for some years and um, did some exploring. And from there kind of came back into living and then had a couple of other pit stops, which we can maybe get into a little later, but basically uh, I've had a church of God background most of my life. And my parents are still in the church, they attend LCG. And along the way, getting some different perspectives and meeting a lot of different people, um, I've learned to make a lot of friends from different backgrounds. And that's sort of what we were, we were talking about how that has shaped a lot of my opinions and uh, sort of just the way that I think not necessarily swaying me to agree with people, but just understanding where people come from and how sure. just because they think differently doesn't mean that you should ostracize them or, or, uh, you know, sure. And, and two <laughs> two key uh, points for people to know going in probably is one that you had a you spent some time in the restored church of God in that journey as well. And yes. um, if, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think I remember you saying that you were you were a minister there for a bit too, right? Yeah, about a, about a year and a half. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> well, I can, I mean, I can jump right into that if you want, but, well, but we're going to get back to it. We're going to get back to it. The yeah, other you let point, me know when you want me to get to that. <laughs> the other point that people should know, uh, because it is relevant and also cause it's a pride thing for me. You're a fellow New Yorker. That's right. Which is important for the sake of the discussion. And because I believe when Tim and I did our podcast episode, the first one, I hyped up being a New Yorker like eight times in that podcast. So now I got a fellow New Yorker on you're outnumbered, Tim. That's right. Uh, yeah, Tim, he doesn't know what he's in for, but well, he, does. Yeah. he knows Long Island pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I grew up on Long Island. We're all New York. impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, grew up on Long Island, in Long Island, New York, and uh, my wife did too. Met her during my journeying years of of kind of being out of the church. We we worked together, then got married, and both came back into the church. She's baptized in the church, and uh, basically moved to Tennessee. When was it? We got married and moved to Tennessee, so it's been a while. Lived in Ohio for a couple of years because those were the 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 years we worked for Restored. Both my wife and I worked for Restored for a little bit, and yeah, taking that northern perspective into the south and yeah. <laughs> well, so you you already demonstrated the ability to adjust for people of differing backgrounds because you said where you lived correctly first, and then everyone in New York realized you changed it to the incorrect way to say it. You said I lived on Long Island, which is the way you should say it. And then yeah. you corrected to in because you knew it would confuse people who aren't from New York. So yeah, I, the, the, I mean, the real truth of that is I don't know what I'm talking about. And just, okay. that's, <laughs> so it's that's fair too. <laughs> I'd rather just sound like the way you said it was better. <laughs> yeah. So, so with that, let's get right into it. Um, one of the things I think it's, it'd be good to, to tell people how we all know each other as well. Um, so maybe we'll start with, with you two, uh, you both were in living together. I'm assuming that's how you got to know each other, correct? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure the first, I think the first time we met was maybe at a Kansas City weekend. I think it was. Yeah. I think I remember the first time we talked, actually. Yeah. yeah. I complimented you on an article your dad wrote. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. Living. yeah. 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 So my dad used to be a, a minister for living. 
And uh, I won you over with flatteries. Yeah, basically that was it. <laughs> I was like, oh, Dan, you know, he's a, he's a cool guy. So um, uh, that's why I thought then and now it's- I mean, Now you know better. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know you too well, but. Um, and then, yeah, so that was what, early 20 aughts? I, 20, I don't know, it was uh, a long time ago. Like it, at least 10 years ago, a decade. And then uh, I moved to Tennessee in 2018 from Missouri. And uh, yeah, so Dan lives like 30 minutes from where I live. I live in Franklin, he lives in Murfreesboro. Um, and yeah, so that's cool. I think that covers and, it. Yeah. Then I met you, Tim, at Winter Family Weekend in like 2018. 19, right? Yeah. Yeah. LCG's the Charlotte weekend. I thought you guys knew each other longer than that. Mm -mm. No. Wow, really? Yeah. Yeah. And Dan, I met you at Williamsburg, right? For the feast. And then we got to know each other when I came through Tennessee, like the following year. I think the first conversation we had, I think that's the first time we met in person. I yeah. feel like the first conversation we had is when I called you up out of the blue and brought up my, my criticisms of CGM with you. <laughs> yeah, probably. And you, and I you took it, it like a champ, man. Accurate. That was like a three-hour conversation or something. And you took it like a champ. It was oh, great. it's great. I mean, that's the whole I was gonna I was gonna build to that. Like, I'm pretty sure our I think all of my closest friendships, or at least like 75%, start with disagreement. Like if we have a really good disagreement right off the bat and it's and it's cool, then like that's a way to get me hooked in a in a friendship. So I think well, why do you think that is? Why do you think that that's a, a common denominator? Because <laughs> I'm a New York Italian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, but like if you think about it. So I feel that I would agree that most of my good friends, and I've been blessed with a lot of good friends, often we don't see eye to eye on things. Obviously not everything, you have to a lot of stuff in common to be friends with people, but mm -hmm. I like people that can disagree. And this is sort of, you know, I guess the, the, the crux of our topic, but it's refreshing to have people that can, number one, be open enough to disagree with you in a respectful way and try and get you to see things from a different perspective. And then number two, that can take criticism or yeah. can take pushback mm -hmm. on a point of view or, or anything like that and not be so offended mm -hmm. the moment right. you disagree. I mean, like some of, my, mm -hmm. some of my best friends, we can unleash on each other. My wife could, could tell you about this back in the day. I've learned to be a lot more diplomatic, you know, but in the past I would often be too overboard with uh, really pushing my point mm -hmm. to the point of like debating to just want to be like hammering things out, wanting to be right. And I never meant it to be offensive and it would often come across badly because of my presentation. Okay. But same struggle. Yeah. But, but I think that there's something to say about, I kind of want people to be very open and forceful in what they believe. I want you to back up and say, as emotionally, as forcefully as you can, what you believe and why. And then we can talk about it. It doesn't mm -hmm. need to, it doesn't ever have to be, you know, an, offen an offense or anything, you know? Right. I think it's definitely a personality thing because certain personalities tend to gravitate towards that and they tend to crave that they experience connection by engaging in debate. And there's an element of honesty and vulnerability that occurs in those interactions beyond just, you know, the normal pleasantries and 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 hiding who you are and what you think um, right. just certain personalities gravitate towards that more and are more comfortable to express it yeah than than others i think that's a key point too tim that i was thinking about when when dan was talking that you mentioned is that it's a person it demonstrates a personality type that is uh, i don't want to say unpretentious but like they're very open. It's not like they're hiding who they are. It, I th and I think for me, it's a comfort to be in a conversation with someone, even if they're not necessarily overly emotional. But if I can tell they're really open to um, critical feedback that I can say what it is I need to say, not worry about having to fine tune it to such a degree and worrying about being um, offensive, that I think it's very disarming and it, and it helps the conversation be a lot more genuine and, and free flowing. But also I wonder, I mean, let me know if this is your experience guys, but for me, I think it's possible to disagree with someone and actually feel like you think way more similarly than people who you are on the same page with, if that makes sense. Like when, when Dan comes to me and, and mentions stuff he disagrees with about CGN, like obviously we don't see eye to eye on those topics, 
but the way he approaches it is something I really identify with. Like his thought process around it makes sense to me. It's familiar. It's um, a, a process I respect. So someone who might come to me and be gung ho uh, positive about CGN, but hasn't done the wh- whatever the, the the thinking that Dan has, almost is means less to me. Like I'm not I'm not going to get as much out of that conversation um, than with someone who cares about me enough, at least that's the way I interpret it, to tell me exactly how they think. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, and I think. Um... It's funny because I was telling Tim this before that Sunday, actually, uh, right before we talked, I, there's a group of friends I play board games with every other Sunday and none of them are in the church. And besides not being in the church, we're, we're pretty opposite, like really in any way you could think we get along socially. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we're friends. We play, we play these board games, but they're so far. A lot of them are almost atheists, radical liberals, like way mm-hmm. out there. And I actually find it helpful in a way to hear Mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons to hear their perspective on things. And um, so this, this last week, we have a mutual friend that he kind of introduced me to the group and he's very, he's not in the church either, but he's very kind of a neutral person, easy to talk to back and forth. But this group, you know, the rest of them are very, very different. They don't think conservative all. They actually kind of hate conservative thinking. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, when, when I was there Sunday, they were venting about how they hate these policies and they hate this and that, all the stuff that's going on in the world from the conservative side. Now, I don't it, obviously get engaged in the politics of the world, but if you were to put me on a spectrum, I'd be more conservative leaning than I would be liberal leaning sure. in, in the world's uh, temperature, I guess, today. Yeah. So my immediate kind of reactions as they're venting and saying all this stuff is, well, I should bring up this counterpoint. And I just decided to shut up and just let them talk, like let them vent, try and see them. I think one of the biggest keys to getting along with anybody is if you pray to see them the way that God sees them. I mean, if you think about it, God sees you. We see us often as how we are right now, Mm -hmm. how you're presenting yourself right now, especially if it's somebody new. But God doesn't see any of us the way we are right now. He sees what you can become. He looks at every one of us and says, this person can become a God being. Like, I mean, Mm -hmm. that great. Do we see other people like that? I mean, (laughs) when we're we're talking to somebody in disagreement, do we say, yeah, they're all amped up right now, but I see them as a God being potentially. Mm -hmm. No, we often just get emotionally involved and get offended. Yeah, (laughs) what an idiot, you know? So uh, for me, I was trying to see it as, this group of people as people that are in the world that don't have knowledge of the truth that have gone through, uh, in some cases, really horrible stuff personally, and just let them vent and try and learn where they're coming from. doesn't mean I agree with their conclusions or their ideology, but it really helps you to view them in a way as God views them. Like they're a human being that has so much potential, the same potential as you and I in God's eyes. And I think that really is almost like the heart of the matter at ever having any conversation where you disagree. It's mm-hmm. that, look, the person might not see what you're talking about, or I might not see what they're talking about, but God knows that, okay, if I put them through X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C, at, they'll get there. They'll, mm-hmm. they'll get there eventually. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And I, I think there are, there are two elements to that too. I think the first thing is, at least for me, is that especially in the church, we should you mentioned, you know, radically liberal, we should probably be able to hear some of the things, uh, some of the gripes they have against whatever it is, Republicans or, or mainstream religion and go, yeah, you're right. You know what I mean? Like there's probably quite a bit of stuff. I mean, uh, we in the church should see quite a bit of hypocrisy in, in organized religion, uh, and, or things that don't make sense, heaven and hell, right? I was talking to someone recently, the idea that if someone is really twisted for 70 years of their life, but they burn in hell for all eternity. That feels like not an equivalent <laughs> punishment. Like, of course, of course, that would be a, a source of um, a, a frustration or, or it would be a disincentive to go that way if you're in the world. And to your point, who knows what these folks have been through? I mean, you, you, you add uh, some significant trauma to the mix and you don't even have the mental or emotional bandwidth to grapple with some of these issues. It's a, it's a struggle just to get through day to day. So the empathy thing, I think to your point is, is critical. Um, 
but I'm wondering for, for both of you, maybe Tim first, what's your experience with being exposed to people who, who think and believe differently than you and actually those people either highlighting, um, dissonance within your own viewpoints, or maybe just points you hadn't considered and, and maybe, uh, things that had caused you to, to grow as a result of exposure to different viewpoints. Um, I mean, I think usually my initial reaction is, uh, the natural reaction is upset and anger, <laughs> but, but then it's like, okay, that's like my animalistic lizard brain thinking. <laughs> if I, if I, uh, to borrow a term, term from evolution, but whatever. Um, uh, but then, you know, you step back and think about it and like, well, let me step out of my, myself and what I'm thinking, whatever my, my biases are and just inhabit whatever mental model that they're working from, you know, and see if there's something there that I can learn or that I, I haven't considered before. Um, I think that's the ideal I strive for, right? Because ultimately I can't, there's a tendency to assume that we have it all figured out, right? And I try not to think that way. I don't mm -hmm. have it all figured out and not everything that I've ever no, believed across Dan <laughs> us, for sure. Yeah. Um, and Dan doesn't either, for no, sure. Pretty much anyone from New York doesn't know either. And, <laughs> um, Fair enough. <laughs> so I guess my point is that um, you have to let go of the assumption that you know everything and that you have the complete vision and picture yeah. of everything that's ever happened in existence yeah. and be able to explore someone else's perspective and viewpoint as informed by their history and experience and yeah. so on and so forth. You know, you know, it's a great, um, I forgot where I heard it, but someone mentioned a really good interview question. They asked candidates especially if it's like executive uh, level decision, like a manager level position, they, they ask the question or they, they, uh, they say, tell me uh, about a time where you were completely wrong about something you were completely sure you were correct about. <laughs> oh yeah. Like, or well, the, a time you changed your mind about something you thought for sure you were, you were right on about. And I think that's a, that's a great question because I feel like everyone should have something like that. And I think talking with people who disagree, even if they're not, at least in my experience, even if they're not correct as well, I think yeah. sometimes getting pushback on your view makes you realize, oh yeah, that is contradictory or yeah, there are some holes in that. Let me go back to the drawing board uh, and take a look at it. Um, Dan, what's your, I mean, at least for me, the, the experience being in New York is, uh, it's inescapable. Cause if you go to public school or I went to, you know, uh, college institutions, you're, you're the minority viewpoint and everything, whether it's social, political, or, or religious, um, it's not a, a situation conducive to that way of thinking. So if you want to make friends in that environment, you can't, you have to be able to disagree with folks positively and you have to, you can't just, uh, only choose to associate with folks who agree the same way you do. But Tim, were you going to yeah. say something? And, and I think, well, I, well, I have two quick thoughts just while we're on this, uh, to camp on a bit. I think, if you haven't changed your mind ever in your life, you haven't grown, you haven't learned, mm -hmm. you know? And then another thing too, um, even if you don't change your mind on the topic by engaging in that, you further inform your opinion and it becomes more solid in your mind as well. Mm -hmm. And that comes through the sharpening process of engaging with the opposition to that as well. Yeah. And so on either end, whatever the conclusion is, there's opportunity for, for growth. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, you have a comment? Well, I was just gonna say it's, it's a weird dynamic. And I know for me personally, others may find it coming more naturally, but it's taken a year. Cause even when I was a little kid growing up, all the friends I had, we'd all hang out, we debate stuff. We talk a lot. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, younger kids today tend to get more roped into video games and stuff. But when you're out socializing, talking all the time, you kind of get this constant conflict potentially, you know, mm -hmm. I guess you can conflict with video games too, but, <laughs> but um, it's a weird, it's kind of a weird mentality to be focused on, okay, because essentially we're all looking for the truth. Even when you're debating a topic, you're debating the truth of that particular topic. Ideally. Yeah. 
you know, uh, true. I do. I, I think. But even the people that are maybe biased and deceived, self-deceived or something are still thinking that that's the truth in their way of thinking. Possibly. I don't know yeah. that I agree a hundred percent. You don't with agree with me? All the time. I don't agree with you, Dan. <laughs> 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 um, I think, especially in today's age, there's less of a value on truth as an mm-hmm. absolute. But I think amongst the three of us here, yeah, okay, having a background in the church, there's an element of trust that I have that all of us are ultimately interested in the truth mm-hmm. and that we value that. And, you know, we might come to different conclusions on a few topics here and there, but ultimately it's from, from a place of, of good intentions and a place where that is a, a, a high value. Yeah. And it's, oh, it's, yeah. It, it's interesting too. I, I remember a, a quote um, from Mr. Armstrong actually about the, uh, about why or what the evidence was that the body of people in WCG was part of the, the true church. And he said, it was that we were able to admit when we're wrong about something. Mm-hmm. So like the church is on record as uh, stating that that is a key component to uh, being converted. And the thing that's interesting is I think we've, as a, as a people moved a bit away from that, not consciously, um, but I think sort of accidentally, but what's, what's inherent in that statement is the only way you can change your mind about something is to have exposure to new information. So like you can get it yourself through study. If you're studying and you're close to God's word and you're, uh, praying and fasting and all those things, that's one way to get new information. But another way is from other people and especially other converted people, um, and uh, just very briefly, I think I told Dan this. I'm almost positive I've told Tim this story before because I say this all the time. Um, mm-hmm. One of my favorite uh, bits that uh, Thomas Sowell writes about in some of his work on the development of cultures is that the most advanced cultures uh, develop along trade routes because those are the places that are exposed to the most new information, new goods and technology. You're getting new people from different parts of the world coming through and the places in the world that are not along trade routes or even worse, if they're broken up or isolated because of geography, like if they're closed in by a mountain range, then they might not see innovation in a lot of things for a long time. And and much of the world will pass them by until they get exposure to a new um, uh, set of cultures and beliefs and and, um, innovations. And I think that principle holds true in the church of God. And I think we're at a point now, maybe it's a good transition to the next part of the topic where the church of God over the last 30 plus years has become so siloed in different organizations because we, as a people, I think have continually self-selected into groups of people who think more and more like us over time that, uh, I think exposure to different viewpoints is not as common. And I think, uh, Dan and I were talking about this recently that I think it's actually, uh, feared. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's, and you know, we've talked about this too. I think there's good reason to fear in one sense because mm-hmm. of the way the church broke up. And I, a lot of, yeah. you know, people, especially younger people might not understand how when Takach took over, you know, when he was appointed and took over the way that they deconstructed the truth was deceptive. Like they just mm-hmm. lied. They yep. lied all the time about what they were going to teach about what they were teaching how they taught it like it was nonstop deception so when you have a group it's different if you were like if you know let's say joe dakash took over and was like you know what we're gonna go keep christmas and be out in the world we've decided that you know mr armstrong was wrong and we're just breaking off and doing this but they didn't do that they yeah. lied for like, I don't know what, like 10, five, seven, eight years, 10 oh, years. I mean, yeah. you can just do however you want to catalog the deception. I mean, they went yeah. on a, a crusade of deception. And when you have people that are mired in a previously trustworthy environment, yep. you know, they're in a cocoon of safety. They're in the true church. They have a leader who's on track. There's fruit being produced, which we often don't talk about that because there's none, frankly, in almost any group out there. Um, there's some here and there, but, but mm. there's, there's really not a lot out there. Okay. To compare Which is, it to what? Well, to compare it to that and, and worldwide. Yeah. And, and that's a lot of the reason why you have the infighting and the bickering. Number one, it's from the way things broke apart. So because it broke apart in such a deceptive environment, 
people get confused mm -hmm. and they don't trust people that are in charge. And so you have these silos that develop where people are afraid kind of to reach out because of the amount of wolves that are out there. Mm -hmm. And and it's very legitimate. I mean, I think it's important when you bring sure. it up to acknowledge yeah. that it's legitimate because I think there are a lot of folks who do want more cross-group fellowship and community and unity who I think might not give that issue uh, the important place it deserves in the conversation because I think that's important. Um, I think it's also important to recognize the uh, the trauma that that breakup uh presented to people and, and, mm -hmm. and put people through not only the membership, but the leadership as well. What I, what I've sensed oh, over the last couple of years yeah. is that the leadership is so traumatized by it. Like there's just so much, man, we just got to make sure we don't have another split because it yeah. was, it's such an impactful thing in people's lives. I mean, it's not just like a, a company dissolving. It's like people's, yeah. uh, the core of their being in the, in the, the, the entirety of their familial and social environment, plus their core beliefs. Like it, there are a lot of things disentangled in that. It's very so I think it's like important. Yeah. yeah. What was that? It's very much like a divorce. Yeah. Yeah. It's a divorce. Yeah. 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 And it makes sense why, why groups, you end up having these justifications for their existence, like, like groups yeah. trying to justify their authority, trying to justify that the true church is in one organ. You know, I used to believe that true church is in one organization. That's one of the reasons I went um, to restored. And, and I felt like that was the place to be. Right. And I, even before then, I thought that living was it. And I thought that you should, you should, uh, if people just put all their eggs in one basket and back one thing, not really understanding the whole, the dynamics of why there's separation, you know, and what, and it really, it really stems from the way it broke up. Yeah. It's the deceptive element of it that, that blossomed into all the confusion that we have today yeah. and then like to your point you know fa that families broke up. i know from when yeah. i was a kid i know families broke up yeah. and divorces happened because of that and that reverberates you know generationally and and how do you how do you then start to get now you have these groups that are afraid of that i say these groups i don't mean to be you know pointing fingers but you have you have groups that feel okay we need to take a stand and establish our authority to the people so they know they have a place to go. And then there's any number shades of, of gray, so to speak, that, that do that. And they have their own reason for doing that. But I think the, the point we miss a lot, which um, we're in the latest scene era, like we're the latest scene church. I, I'm so sick of hearing groups and people say, and not everyone does it and not all groups do it, obviously, but they say, well, where are the Philadelphian you know, group in the latest scene era. Like, nah, you, you could hope, we can all hope and aim for, obviously, that we are Philadelphia. That's what we're, our goal to be in this kind of church age if we're looking at it like that. We are the latest scene church. I mean, we 100% are. I would say, personally, in my bet, on my best days, I'm probably at best latest scene. <laughs> no problem. Can't, and not to go down the whole church era's rabbit hole, but, you know, the counter argument just to, play devil's advocate yeah. is that well in worldwide's day if that's ostensibly the philadelphian era there was also coexisting with it the sardis era and blah 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 so there's the possibility of a philadelphian remnant living amongst again like i don't know that it's here nor there but either it's, way yeah. go ahead dan sorry no i was just gonna say like i think it's just indicative of of uh the fact that whether it's the the trauma it it imposed it, it presented to leaders and they still hold membership, whether it's the the psychological trauma going through it, if it's an actual divorce that came from the church splits, uh, or it's people who who want to elevate themselves as better than other folks in the Church of God community, I think those things present the the like the human element of this, the the things that affect the emotions. And, and incentivize certain ways of thinking that might be more rooted in emotion and um, fear as opposed to, to logic. But if we're going to, for the sake of the conversation, try to say, well, what it move, try to talk about the church of God moving from wanting to be more homogeneous and in their silos to being more open to other viewpoints and groups. And as a result risk, because that's what we really are asking is that, people open themselves up to a degree of, yeah, it's not going to be comfortable disagreeing, especially if you're not born and raised in that environment where that's okay. 
Um, but then I think it comes to a second point, which we've talked about before, uh, which is there's a, what I've realized is there's a fear among leadership about the uh, ability of members to let's say, uh, there are a lot of leaders who want cross group fellowship and more of it, but they're concerned that perhaps the members won't be able to navigate, um, the different, the differences in doctrine, not even, even if they're not that fundamental, that there are so many, as Dan said, either wolves or just so many, um, landmines of, of, uh, doctrinal issues to, to disagree over that are you bringing about a situation where there's going to become more conflict and it's going to become worse rather than better. And that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate thing. And, and Dan and I were talking about that. I know Tim, you and I have talked about it. I'm assuming you and Dan have talked about it. Um, but, uh, (laughs) <laughs> I think that's I think that's a good uh, place to park ourselves for a bit, and that is, if we do have a a membership that isn't able in mass to navigate these different not only opinions but frankly cultures, the cultures in the different Church of God organizations are very different right now. Um, mm-hmm. Then why is that the case, and what do you do to help rectify that or start to move the needle on it? You want to tackle that? Or- you want me to go? <laughs> I mean, you know what? I think what your question speaks to more fundamentally is just asking yourself: Is there value to even attempting that? Right? Like, is is there value to to maintaining any relationship there across the Church of God? And when I say Church of God, I mean the greater sense of it, the spiritual mm-hmm. organism, right? And of course. You, I mean, I believe there is value, right? Um, do a lot in part to my background and, and how that has shaped my perspective. And so the way that you navigate it is the same way you would navigate a disagreement with a family member. You know, you're still family. And I think also recognizing the fact that the commonalities shared are so far greater than the differences that occur that that is the point to start from, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than solely being worried about, about the differences, not to belittle the differences. I think the differences are important, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And that's one thing we've talked about. Like I'm not at this stage of the game, I'm not pro corporate organizational unity across the board. But at least uh, there should be some semblance of recognition that we're spiritual cousins or brothers and sisters in some sense. And with that as a basis, um, then, then comes just the skill of being able to have a civil discussion and be able to talk about topics that you disagree about without making it this emotionally charged um, uh, situation or try to force your will and opinion on another person, you know, let them have theirs, discuss it. And who knows, maybe you'll persuade them. Maybe you'll learn some new information too, which goes back to our earlier point. Yeah. And that was, and that sort of speaks to the the first podcast episode um, that you and I did about how to disagree in love and the importance of that. Um, Dan, maybe you can speak to, cause you and I talked about this recently, the, the fact that, you know, not only do I think we should be able to get into circumstances where, Hey, let's focus on the commonality first, but at some point you do need to ad- either address, or you just know, inherently the disagreements are going to come up. Like it's, it's unavoidable and you can't pretend that that's not going to be the case. So the, I think one of the fears and it's legitimate, I think it's a reality is that when when certain groups of people get exposed to different views, there's a fear of deception, not only amongst the, the ministry, but amongst the individual. I know a lot of individual like members who fear exposure to, to different viewpoints because they feel like they're going to be deceived. Um, and I think that prevents engaging in disagreement that could help both parties learn. Uh, and as you and I have talked about, I think it stems from the individual not being sufficiently grounded in their own beliefs. Do you want to speak to that for a bit? Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's that's the key of your of, of our call. I mean, essentially, uh, is that it's your relationship with God, 
Mm-hmm. You know, no, no organization, family member, spouse, friend is going to save you. <laughs> yeah. we, we have, if, if we don't have a relationship with God, we're, we're going to be constantly in a state of uncertainty. So one of the reasons I said before that I would make the decision to go to restore it again was because when I made this, when I was attending living at the time and there were reasons I won't get into all this stuff. Like there were reasons why I was like, well, I feel like, you know, maybe I should go to restore it. I felt like that was the place that, that God wanted me to go. That at the time I felt that the church was in one organization and I was kind of looking for that organization. And a, a lot of what I went through at that time with friends that I would talk to was a lot of uh, rejection and pushback. And I would often say, I would try and say like, look, I'm, here's what I think. I think this is the right thing to do. And I would just get yelled at even for thinking about it, not yelled mm-hmm. at, but I, I would get, I would get dismissed for even considering. Rather than having a discussion, right. it was just, oh, Dan's crazy or it's dismissive of your concerns. Or exactly. Your concerns. There's the, what my minister said to me at the time was, well, there's no point in even talking to you. You've already made up your mind. And I had not made up my mind. Yeah. Yet. I was literally having questions, wanting to talk about it, but that's how he responded. I mean, so, but whatever. So it got to the point where I said, look, I prayed. People always, I always find that people always say this too. Everyone's like, well, I prayed and fasted and this I is what I'm going to be. That, okay. And I feel, still felt the same way. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> yeah. I believe, I think you guys do too, that God, there are spirit begotten brethren in different organizations. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, if all of them are praying and fasting to be in the right, the same place, yeah. why are they all in different places? Mm-hmm. So a lot of times when I would say that people would dismiss it because it's like, well, I prayed and fasted and God told me to stay here. Mm-hmm. So it would almost be kind of dismissed that I even did it legitimately. Mm-hmm. What did you even really pray? You're just following your emotion to an organization. That that's kind of the feedback that I got. But I, I knew internally that I wasn't. Um, and my, I'll throw my wife in there too. Both of us were, were not doing that. So anyway, we made the decision finally to go and stayed there for a couple of years. We had a great time for a couple of years. And as you said, I, you know, I was a minister for about a little, little bit over a year. And it, it started to fall apart doctrinally. Um, I won't get into to all of it, but there were some really big red flags that came up. But what's interesting is that I stayed in touch with some friends and people that I knew mm. from living in other groups, even though Restored was actually telling people not to talk to anyone. Mm. I was like, nah, I'm probably going to talk to people. <laughs> so, <laughs> by, by the way, that still happens. I, yeah. I know of a bunch of people who are still keeping in contact. And it that's the other thing that... It, I don't know if it's an elephant in the room, but it's something that is happening and people just aren't acknowledging it. Like even in those groups, a lot of folks are going, oh, okay, whatever. Like I'm still going to talk to my family. You can say I can't talk to my family through another group, but I'm going to do it anyway. So, Which is funny because if you think about a leader that tells you to do that, it's not that they're warning you, hey, be careful. You know, if these people, because if you think about like the scriptural warning, it's like, beware of people that are like trying to pull you out. And you'll know the people are trying to pull you out. Because they're trying to pull you out. They're, they're like, they're bashing you. They're hammering you on doctrine, on this, on that. If they're in the world, like, oh, you should keep Christmas. You're a heathen. Like, look, we don't need to talk anymore if this is how you're going to engage me. Mm-hmm. But not to go too, too off the deep end with, with this, but basically. Um, well, I think what you're saying is if, and correct me if I'm wrong, if it's civil and you're like, hey, this is my opinion. This is your opinion. Let's live with that. That's one thing. But if it's another thing where they're actively trying to, I suppose, recruit you, you know, that's yeah. another level that. Well, well that's uh, the level you should be worried about. Exactly. That's, that's what, what that's what you're warned about. Yeah. And often we think that it's just and leaders have and, you know, to. Like Dave Pack would have this element of it. I mean, they would tell you you shouldn't talk to them, mm-hmm. even like married couples. I mean, they got to the point where they were just and they still are incredibly divisive in that way they're actively now sowing division because you don't even know the person's not even doing anything wrong so um i think there's an interesting i think there's an interesting point baked into this though too which is 
Um, you, you talk about the way we often treat each other when someone makes a decision that we don't uh, agree with. Something that was impactful to me that I had heard in a in a sermon a couple of years ago was part of uh, not only dealing with people, but having faith is having faith in God's spirit in the other person. Mm-hmm. That when you, if I think Dan Quimby or Tim Reynolds has God's spirit and they do something I disagree with, even if I think I'm right, I should have faith that God is working with you. And eventually, even if you are doing something out of emotion, or even if you are misguided at the point that you will get to where God needs you to be the same way. If I'm wrong, God will get me to where I need to be. So by not doing that, by not trusting the person or not giving the person the latitude to make their own decision, which is something God allows us to do, Mm -hmm. um, that we're not having faith in God's Holy spirit working in that person. doesn't mean we have to agree with everything, but we have to give people the space to exercise the free will the same way God does. Yeah. And, and to kind of just tie it up with what I was saying before with restored, that, that goes right with your point is that the, the whole time I was making those transitions, I, you know, I'm praying and studying about it and I'm okay. God, is this what, what do you think about, you know, when Dave Pack started to really go off track and I say, I'm saying doctrinally taking titles, stuff like that, mm-hmm. claiming to be a prophet, all this crazy stuff. Like in the, in the beginning of it, I didn't jump ship right away. Mm-hmm. And some people were like, you know, what's wrong with you? Like, why would you stay there? It's like, well, I prayed and fasted for a long time and went through a bunch of experiences that God took me through that made me believe it was the right decision to stay here. And I would always kind of go over in my head often. You know, I mean, frankly, every pastor, we should do this kind of stuff. I go, why am I doing this? Why am I making the decisions I'm making? Why do I attend where I attend? Why do I believe what I believe? Over and over and over again. And I felt like there is some wisdom in giving time for God to correct something. So in the church environment right now, sometimes things go, a decision's made or something goes off track and people immediately will jump shit. And maybe they have reasons for doing that. You know, I've certainly done that before. I've done that recently, (laughs) but I would say that if you ask me, Oh, am I, am I in the 100% right? Like organization? I don't know. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I'm, I could tell you exactly why I've made the decision and I could tell God the same exact thing because that's what I've discussed with him already. And that's why, I'm, but I don't for one second think that, oh, this is the end all be all. For me, it's just the journey going back to God sees yeah. you as what you can become. He, he's kind of taking you through experiences. You have to, we, we all have to learn to trust him yes. in the decisions we make. And we can't be afraid to make a decision if we feel like we're being pulled in a direction and we're and we're consciously, prayerfully making a decision, then just make the decision. Have faith in God. Look, he can bring you back. He's done it to me before. He can bring you back if you're wrong. hundred that's percent. That's the key point here. So I think what we're talking about throughout this whole conversation is the importance of the pursuit of truth and, and <laughs> in pursuit of truth. Uh, exposing yourself to people of opposing opinions is very valuable. Oftentimes people conflate. So you, you pray and fast, you think about a decision a lot, and then you make it. And people think having faith and being immovable, that that was the right decision is having faith in God. When that is not having faith in God, that's having, that's having an, uh, an overconfidence in your own ability to uh, make a decision being, being okay with being, with making a decision, like you said, and then God showing you after a period of time, Hey, look, you were wrong there. You did make that based on emotion is part of the pursuit of truth. <laughs> we're, all, we're all doing a cheers here. There you go. Um, no, you're, yeah, you're right. I mean, that, that's the journey of it. Yeah. And frankly, it's inseparable from actually, and, and, you know, again, like just stop me if I'm talking too much about my own experience. Cause I don't, I don't mean to no, that's what we're here capitalize for. it. But like, I, I really feel powerfully about how God brought, I thank him all the time about how he brought me through there. I remember praying when I was in RCG that I, we had a great time. Like, I, honestly, I love the people there. There's people that still attend there that I love. They've cut me off, which sucks. Cause I would never <laughs> talk doctrine. I like, look, if you don't want to discuss it, we, why can't we still be friends? I mean, mm. you know, I, I miss them. And I, I would, if they were to, were to come out at any point, I would welcome them with arms. I, the first thing I wouldn't say to them is I told you so I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and that's, you know the, I mean, but like, and that's, the thing to keep, that's the thing to keep in mind though, for everyone listening is that 
you know, people will, will put restored in Philadelphia in the extreme category, which is legitimate. They are, but yeah. everyone I've met who have, has come out of those organizations has the same feeling towards the brethren there that, that you do, that they lament it, that they, there, there was value in their experience there. They miss those folks. There are God's people there. So I think it's important for us to keep that in mind, but go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, so, so when God took me through that whole experience, um, I tend to be, as you guys probably know, I tend to be extreme, right? I'm, I'm like, I'm never in the middle, right? God I'm says, you know, be balanced. Yeah. I'm either to the left or to the right. And then when I realize when I'm on the left and I realize I'm wrong, I'm like, okay. And then I go like, all the way to the right. And then, so I course correct. And we're but intense. So, we're intense people. We're intense, right? Yeah. So I think that I thank God all the time for that experience because it helped me to really understand um, it, it showed the fact it increased my faith so much. A lot of people that get roped into groups, whatever they are, even in the world, like cults or stuff like that. And they start, and here's kind of the danger of some of the more extreme COG groups too, is that when a man places himself in the place of God, whether it's by title or by an, any number of things that he could do that. Um, now, and, and we accept that whoever it is that's attending there accepts that for a period of time you're now, you're now in danger of following an idol. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying you're worshiping it, but over time, that's exactly what it ends up becoming. And it's in place of God, it kind of cuts you off from that. But if you, if you always keep your, your relationship with God through the whole experience of what you're doing, he's mm -hmm. never going to put you in a position where you won't notice that and then give you a way of, I mean, it's scriptural. You have a way of escape to get out. And I think a, a central point in that though, is if the desire and the effort is in the pursuit of truth. Uh, there's a, there's a, a great phrase that, that my dad has, which is uh, what truth are you afraid of? Like hypothetically, if we were supposed to keep Christmas, what's the downside of realizing that's true. Like, obviously yeah. it's not, none of us believe it, but that's an extreme case. If it's true, if you discover something is true, why would you be afraid to pursue that? And, and I think the, it's sort of a, it's a bit rhetorical because I think we know that for most folks, it's in for, for all of us, for, for three of us here, for everyone, it's not as simple as just making an objective decision. There's all kinds of biases there's emotion that does come into play. There's personal experience. So all our decisions are not pure. They're clouded with, with a whole lot. Um, but if we're striving to, to take that out of the equation and pursue truth, regardless of if it makes us uncomfortable, I think that's how you get to be a place when you're okay, where you don't feel like, Hey, I can't even expose myself to something else because I'm going to be drawn off track. I'm going to be deceived. It, it results in like an extreme lack of confidence, not only in yourself, but in God's spirit within you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and I, and I think that uh, as you're exposed to different points of view, sort of an ancillary, but wonderful benefit is you learn to understand why people think the way they do. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. there's a lot of legitimate reasons why people can come to believe things that you might think are crazy. Yes. <laughs> And they and might, they might be crazy, but it's still the way they got there was sort of understandable. Right. And, and like, it could be background, it could be environment, it could be any number of, of factors that get into that. But I just think that part of being a light to people is, well, I mean, the essence, I guess, of being a light to people is that if you're not close to God, you're not going to be a light. Because yeah. God's not living, yeah. God's not shining through you. The so light is not us. The light's God. The light is not us. Yeah. yeah. And the light wouldn't be on if you weren't. Right. So, um, you know, I just think that there are a lot of times, put it this way, friends and family that we all know will make bad decisions. They'll do stuff that we're like, that's a terrible decision. I don't agree with you. The worst thing you could do is cut them off. Mm -hmm. The only biblical reason for cutting people off is like we discussed. If they're actively trying to get you to go against your faith in God and your belief in the scriptures, like if they're actively pushing and even after you've said, Hey, look, I don't want to talk about it anymore. We could talk about basketball, sports, whatever you want to talk about. We could socialize, but this is, you know, I'm, this is where I stand. Please don't bring it up. If they just keep hammering you, well, then you just stop talking soon. Yeah. You know, that's the, what, you know, right. go ahead. And, that, and the, the, the key thing there too is if you, 
if you cut someone off because they disagree and they're in the church, right? It doesn't fall into the category you just said. When you cut someone off, you're eliminating the source of God in this hypothetical potential godly information. If if you're if you're being that light, if you're uh, correct in this, the only way to ensure that that person stays off track is to cut off contact with them. So in the church of God, if, if one group believes another group is off track, let's say hypothetically the right, you know, a great way to guarantee that that group stays off track, never interacting with them because <laughs> that yeah. group now never hears any of the arguments or the, the reasons for the viewpoint of the group um, that believes that you're just staying in your silos and people are repeating the same mistakes ad nauseum over the course of decades. Sometimes we either overblow what the differences are, or we overblow the extent to which we're going to be led off track by like simplistic reasoning or something. I don't but know. But you... I think that, and I don't, I don't disagree with you that it's good to expose yourself and think critically. But the problem is that, as we said, people don't have a strong relationship with God. You probably shouldn't expose yourself if you don't have a strong relationship with God. Yeah. That's what well, you should I, do. Like I, get yourself right with, with God, you yeah. know. Well, to that point and to Tim, because I know you want to say something on that, but maybe that's a good way to end it is if that's the reality is that we have a problem with um, being whatever intellectually or as, as grounded in our beliefs as we should before God, what's the path forward to that? Tim, I don't know if that was what you were going to talk about. You could make whatever your statement and then uh, um, address it. But It wasn't, but I will okay. back that up to say that ultimately, regardless of any of this, like, the foundation is having a firm foundation and relationship with God and a firm foundation in the fundamentals of our faith, right? And another example in line with the one you brought up is like there's some of these websites like Banned by HWA. Right, perfect example. I would never recommend that anybody make a steady diet of checking out the latest posts on Just a waste of time, yeah. Right. Um, you know, maybe once in a while, like you go just out of curiosity. I, I, I don't recommend that for your own mental health. But at the same time, to be completely uncomfortable with people of that mindset or be uncomfortable with the conflict that comes from a conversation uh, around that uh, is also not healthy, too, because you got to be able to combat that. Right. And there are people um, who are still in the church of God who who believe some of that. Yeah, and, and if you if you cannot um, uh, if you cannot argue some of those points, right, and explain why you believe what you believe or yes. you're doing yeah. what you're doing, good point. That's that good. is you're on rocky footing. Yeah, that's a great, great point. point. You know, again, not to say there's a balance. Like you, I would not recommend that you spend a lot of your free time in negativity, but you need right. to be able to be solid with where you are at with God and the decisions you've made and be able to articulate them. And if you can't, you've got a lot of homework to do. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to reemphasize too, don't be afraid to make a decision. Like do yeah, it, yeah. do it prayerfully, do it with knowledge, but don't fear it. Because God Being toward can, action. Yeah, because God can bring God can restore if you make a bad decision. Yeah. You know, then God can maybe there's a reason why God is allowing you to go ahead with that decision. And he yes. can bring you through the lessons learned of yeah. that. And you're gonna come out even better and more knowledgeable. And then like, you know, it's only gonna increase your faith. If you think it's gonna destroy your faith. No, nah, it only increases your faith. There's cause... risk in all of this. Like yeah. I, I, it might be not an exact application, but I just thought of the parable of the talents. Like if you're just mm -hmm. going to sit on it, yeah, and you're not going to do something with the gifts that you have, that's just as condemnable as you know going down the wrong path, making the wrong decision. Yeah. But ultimately, there's redemption. There's the ability to come back from. It. That's that's the key in all this too. Is that there's a difference between faith. <laughs> in yourself and faith in God. And oftentimes we conflate the two. We make a decision and we're so fearful about needing to admit at some point it's wrong. All we're demonstrating is that like we, we haven't put complete trust in complete trust and faith in God is this is the best of my knowledge right now. I know I don't know everything. If God shows me this is wrong, I have no problem changing it. 
because he knows and I don't. Make I'm going into this decision knowing yeah. I don't have perfect information. Right. And if you go in thinking, I have all the information I could possibly need, whatever I decide is going to be correct. You just not having faith in God. People often think that is, but it's just having faith in yourself. It's self uh, aggrandizement. It's not faith in God. But Dan, it seems like you were. Or there's the element of checking your brain in and letting somebody else oh, yeah. do your spiritual life. Which is easy to do. Which sure. should be a complete other topic. Well, I was going to say, man, <laughs> is that our next podcast, if we do another one, Together, yeah, we got it. Which I'm loathing the very thought, but um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, is we should do a podcast on how to bear fruit. How do <laughs> church members bear fruit? What are ways, practical ways, inter organizationally? You're doing some of it already with some of the stuff you know that CGM promotes, but anyway, it could just be something because that's just a thought. I thought. That's it, number one. That's great. Number two, one of the big things that uh, was interesting to hear in a, in a recent sermon, or like maybe a year or two in a sermon, was that um, the fruits of the spirit in Galatians are a command, mm-hmm. interesting. which is an interesting way to frame that. Right? It's not like that's oh, how you could start the podcast. That would be a perfect right? start to right. Maybe, maybe you could be one of our producers. We'll bring Dan Quimby on as a CGM podcast producer. He'll be in charge of content and topics. Yeah. Dude, content <laughs> strategy. Send me, an e- send me an email. I'll see what content I can do. Content strategies. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I think we'll, we'll call it there, guys. Thanks again for, uh, for joining us, everyone uh, watching and listening. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Tim, for, for coming on. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun.